What's on my mind? I do get obsessed. One recent obsession is lines. I see them everywhere. The lines that the eye creates when there are none, connecting the dots so that we perceive whole objects even when they're occluded. The lines that connect our thoughts in our minds, the neurons in our brains, and our paths in the world. The line the hands draws. Lines aren't necessarily straight, but they need to connect. Then there are the lines we create when we arrange our stuff in our homes and in the world, walls and shelves and streets. Another obsession, not unrelated, is perspective. Yours or mine, and neither yours nor mine, but rather from above, a map. Maps are a major feat of the mind. The mind can imagine a map of a large place we've explored, even if we've never seen a map of it or seen it from above. You can find ancient maps carved in stone or painted on walls of caves all over the world. Map-like perspectives, overviews, or surveys capture arrangements of lines or paths and landmarks or points, not just in real space, but also in imaginary space, a social landscape or a political one. That's a longer story for another time. It's really structure that I keep circling back to. Note that word, circle. How do we structure our moving, changing thoughts? And how do we structure the world we design and move and act in? The venerable view of the movement of thought is association. Thought is associative, sure. But a three-year-old would ask, where do the associations come from? They're not random, they're organized, and in many ways. And three-year-olds have long begun to form them. Chair, table, both in the category furniture or the theme dining room. Early on, we form categories, stuff we eat, stuff we wear, stuff we play with. More formally, food, with subcategories like fruit and cheese and bread, clothing, with subcategories like shirts and pants and pajamas, toys with subcategories like cars and blocks and dolls. There are also themes, stuff that gets used together, like bathtubs and sinks and towels, or pots and pans and dishes and refrigerators and stoves, or paper and pencil and scissors and glue. Typically, we arrange our homes around both categories and themes. Foods in the kitchen, food in one place, cheese in another, together with pots and pans and refrigerators. Toys are in a bedroom, or more realistically for three-year-olds all over the house, along with books and clothing and beds. Think now of word associations, a standard measure. Do we respond chair to table because they're in the same category, or because they're used together, they're in the same theme? For years, cognitive and developmental psychologists thought that categorical associations were more sophisticated than thematic ones. That view has been challenged, and surely we need both. So far, we have categories and themes in our minds and in the world. Your mind might have jumped back to lines. We arrange towels and dishes and toys and lines on shelves. That seems by necessity. After all, there's gravity. But we line up windows and rows in apartment and office buildings. Surely that doesn't. Gravity doesn't require that. Buildings are lined up on streets. Streets are traditionally lined up in grids, not just in the west, but also in the east. Also, not required by gravity, more likely by our desire to organize. I did say lines are not necessarily straight, though there are huge advantages to straight lines. But you might be thinking, what about the curved paths and streets common in U.S. suburbs and Chinese gardens? Answers. First, almost nothing is always. Note the hedge. I added almost. Second, 
The curved streets aren't so much designed to disorient you, though they do that, but to give a feeling of mystery and discovery, and perhaps to slow down traffic. There's aesthetics too. Some people like curves, others like lines. Our arrangements in space go far beyond lines and categories and themes. We create hierarchies of categories, plates on one shelf, bowls on another, arranged by size, books arranged by topic, then ordered alphabetically by author, table settings arranged in one-to-one -one correspondences. Everyone gets a plate and a glass and a napkin and cutlery. There are also symmetries and repetitions and recursions in both the outsides and the insides of buildings. There are orderly arrangements in time as well as space. It's beginning to sound like programming. We've become an, an answer to the question, how do we structure our thoughts and our world? Many ways, not just one, and they mirror each other. We put our minds in the world. The mind in the world creates common ground for our collective thoughts. It informs us, tells us what it is. It directs our thoughts and it directs our actions. Think how different our world looks, where nearly everything is designed from the world of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Think of what that organization, an organization by abstractions, does to our minds and to our bodies, even tiny minds and tiny bodies.